In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. The mansion you think you receive is the introduction to the mysteries you have not been taught. The King James Version only uses the word mansion once. In Greek, the word is abode and translated properly in the same chapter and the rest of the Bible as abode and abide. In this study, there are two words we need to look at. We know that the first, mansion, is the word abode and abide. So this one is done with. The other word is mystery. Because of the depth of this study, the mystery will be its own presentation. We will begin with the Gospel according to John and show that the mysteries written of by John and Paul are the progressive revelation of the mansion in John's Gospel account. This word for mansion, which is abide, appears a few times in general statements like, and he abode there since it was the tenth hour of the day. Then there are typological uses like in John 4.40, where, quote, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, unquote. The two days is the age of the church length, 2,000 years. Samaritans, being of the northern tribe of Israel that were led into captivity into Syria, came back and mixed with the Gentiles. So they are half Jew and half Gentiles. But don't pretend like Judah didn't do the same in Babylon. They are the rejects of Israel, and they are like the two made twain into one new man one of the mysteries that will be discussed later. This is the mystery of the body of Christ. So we see the word abode is also a picture of something greater, a typology. Oh yes indeed. But that's not the focus of the study. The mystery of the mansion begins in John 12 and really takes off in John chapters 13 through 15. The first epistle, that is 1 John and Ephesians and Colossians and sprinkled throughout Romans and Philippians, just pretty much everywhere, Peter has it too, is the mysteries. In John 12, 46, we read, quote, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness, unquote. This is the beginning of Jesus' revelation of this mystery. Jesus spoke much about believing in him for eternal life, like in John 3, 16, and that the works of God are believing in him, in John 6, 28 and 29 and that the will of the Father is to believe on the one in whom he has sent, in John 6.40, to name a few. Now we learn something new, quote, Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness, unquote. This is not a conditional if you do X, Y, Z, then you'll be in the light statement. No, it is a promise. It isn't something you do or you don't do, it is a reality of being alive in Christ Jesus. If you believe in him, you are in the light. Today, you will learn the armor of God to quench fiery darts. There are some admonitions by Paul about not inheriting the kingdom of God in Ephesians 5 and Galatians 5 and elsewhere, and speak about those who walk in darkness, that is, the unbelievers, or those who work the works of the law of either Moses or the law of creation from Romans. Snare verses that the devil uses as flaming darts to those without armor. It is not God's plan for you to abide in darkness. It isn't a maybe, like if I'm walking in light, then that means I'm being obedient. And when I'm not obedient, then I'm walking in darkness. No, whoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness, a promise. Moving forward to John 13. The focus is on the Last Supper, the washing of the disciples' feet, important, Judas' betrayal, important, and when Satan enters Judas, in John 13, 31, we read, quote, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him, unquote. The main point is God is glorified in God. It is the glorification of God that matters, not my glorification not yours, and I'm not trying to be a pessimist. Just bear with me. Verse 32, quote, If God be glorified in him, Jesus, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him, unquote. Ever wonder what this means? I mean, really means? The whole thing about Christ being our mediator and our advocate is because of this moment right here. 
We will come to find out this is just the initiation of Jesus' glorification because Mary isn't allowed to touch him until after he ascends to the Father to be glorified after defeating death when he was resurrected. He is the mediator because Jesus has always been God incarnate all the way back walking in the garden, wrestling with Jacob, eating with Abraham, etc. Colossians 1.15, quote, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, unquote. But now, God is no longer a non-materialistic spirit sitting on the throne of heaven. He is a perfect man, glorified. A man sits on the throne in heaven. This man, Jesus Christ, gives us access to be seated in heavenly places because he too is a man perfect and glorified, and in the Father. But we can only do it when we access it through Him. He has the monopoly on how to get to God. The Father, who is a spirit even unto now, quote, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Unquote. That's 1 Timothy 1.17. This same verse in John 13, 32 is also the expression of the eternal covenant. Hebrews 13, 20, quote, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, unquote. This is not the covenant of Moses, nor the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 and reference in Hebrews 10. Those are for Israel, not the church, not the body of Christ. We are under the everlasting covenant. More on the everlasting eternal covenant later. In summary, we have God in God, Son in the Father, and Father in the Son. This is a big piece of this mystery and it extends out further and is the way forward for us who believe. John 13, 33, quote, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, wherever I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, unquote, you cannot come. So the apostles no longer can follow him. That is a bigger statement than a passing glance will give you realization for. As far as a timeline, what was the first thing Jesus said in making the apostles his disciples? Andrew. Simon Peter, John, and James, follow me. Now they hear after three and a half years, you cannot follow me any longer. Talk about your heart dropping to the pit of your stomach. You're breaking up with me? That's a terrible surprise. They must have felt wretched in that moment. The rest of the chapter deals with Peter's confusion, anguish, vitriol, and the admonition he receives that he will himself deny Christ thrice. Peter wants to continue to follow Christ, but Jesus is placing an end to their discipleship program that he had them follow him during his earthly ministry. A new commandment and a new discipleship program is initiated. Quote, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another, unquote. That's verse 35. Luke's version of discipleship has a very brute reality of this first form of discipleship. You have to understand that the discipleship of today is not like the discipleship of the apostles. Unless your lordship salvationists and they love Luke's account of discipleship. In Luke 14, 26, we read, quote, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and also his own life, he cannot be my disciple." Unquote. That's just a taste. Go read the discipleship account in Luke chapter 14 for yourself. It's not good stuff. It is apparent that Jesus did not want his believers to simply follow him as disciples. That may sound like a heretical statement, but analyze the passages. So indeed, when someone thinks they are godly, they call themselves a follower of Jesus Christ, or I'm one of Christ's disciples, 
to try and distinguish themselves from the rest of the Christendom pack is nothing more than self-justification, ego, and pride. Where I go, you cannot follow. In a moment, Jesus tells them in John 14 that they know the way to where he will be. So either Jesus is flipping his words and doesn't make sense, or something is changing and we're the ones that have been blinded to it. John will clarify by calling this a new commandment and the old commandment in his epistle. And this has nothing to do with the Mosaic Law stuff. Something new, not something we have to do or not do as far as following commandments. It is simply the truth of the situation, the reality of life. It is the Discipleship 2.0 program, the Body of Christ, and Christ in you. Things changed at the cross, obviously, duh. And that entails the new discipleship and the gospel of salvation. So don't be duped by idiots who try to tell you that you need to be a disciple like the apostles were disciples. In the end, they all forsook him, remember? And if they say to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to pick up your cross daily. The verse that flows from hating your father and your mother and so on. Mark and avoid them. Jesus knew people would try to justify themselves in this exact manner. Every time you hear a hard teaching from Jesus like this one, or the one to cut off your hand and to gouge out your eye, or the one to eat his flesh and to drink his blood, it is to expose people thinking they can play a role in their salvation with Jesus. No, Jesus alone without your help. He is here to help you, not to have you pollute his perfect works with your corrupted help, which only sabotages his will. Okay, great. Great rebuke, guys. Let's go. John 14, 2. Quote, in my Father's house are many mansions, abodes. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, quote, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, unquote. When these verses are isolated outside of context, people see the rapture. No, it's bigger than that, and it's better than that. Abode should be obvious by now, is dwelling place, tabernacle, temple, home. Jesus ain't preparing a mansion for you for the rapture. I will come again and receive you unto myself is the Holy Spirit that he brings up in a moment coming to live in us whom believe. That is the context, and context is king. It is the flow from the big verse of 32 in chapter 13, his glorification process, it is the process of God becoming all in all. Quote, If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Unquote. Because of this, he is able to justify you. He is able to be our sanctification. We are able to dwell in heavenly places. This is the gospel, folks. It is far more than mansions and rewards of riches to satisfy the desires of the carnal mind. Am I calling you carnal? Well, that depends. Are you excited to learn the deeper promises of God? Or are you mad that I'm saying it ain't the rapture and you don't get a mansion? Chill out, the rapture still happens. Focus. Because of Jesus' glorification, we have the opportunity to be where he is in heavenly places. Even as we are alive on a quarantine plane of sinful existence. John 14, 4, quote, And whither I go, you know, and the way you know, unquote. Now compare this to, quote, But where I go, you cannot follow, unquote. How do we reconcile the difference of these two verses? The one from 14, 4 and the one from the end of chapter 13. Well, I already did. It's the Apostles' Discipleship Program ending, done over the original discipleship program showed the apostles that even with the powers of god manifested in them 
they will still forsake Christ. Yes, Mark 14.10, quote, And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked, unquote. The fleshly discipleship program was meant to show the apostles and us that we cannot follow Christ in our flesh. In the end, we will all forsake him in our flesh. That is a reality to be understood, and that's why God has laid out a better way, the way he is introducing right now. A side note on the naked man. It's a picture of Adam in the garden. Yeah, the Garden of Gethsemane is a redemption of the Garden of Eden, but that's another topic, maybe another video in the future. Typology. Back on track. Now there is a new program and Jesus is introducing it to his apostles. The apostles don't think they understand or know the way that Jesus is talking about. They are confused and Thomas and Philip are asking questions about what Christ means. The answer is the same it always was, through Christ. Christ is the commandment. There isn't some secret to it. Yes, I'm going to speak on the mysteries hid from the foundations of the world, but access to heavenly places is the exact same thing that saved us from sin, Jesus himself. Verse 5, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. You've read this a hundred times, if not a thousand times, but I hope to impart the depths of what it means. Verse 6, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Get this. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Unquote. This is only applicable to them and now us from this moment forward on the timeline. The moment Satan took that bait like the bloated fish that he is when he entered Judas Iscariot, set in motion the mysteries of God, which gives us access to the Father for the first time since Adam fell. In verse 10, quote, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, unquote. Jesus first said these words in John 10, actually, and the Jews moved to stone him for blasphemy for calling himself God. What else is in John 10? It's one of my favorite chapters. It's the sheep pin and the hirelings, the wolves. It's the two folds that will have one shepherd, the Jews via Israel, and the future, as of the time when he said it, body of Christ about to be revealed. It is Jesus making his first proclamation that he is in the Father and, the, and that the Father is in him. And it is Jesus escaping on Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. Personally, I believe this is the prelude and typology of the rapture on Hanukkah, where Jesus escaped them as the picture of the escape of his body, as we are to escape the tribulation according to Luke. The other fold, the body of Christ, escapes. The rapture is the collection of the purchased possession that had been on layaway purchased by the blood of Christ these last 2,000 years, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Now that verse also said the Father's works. So who does the works? The Father. Jesus tells us himself. He does the works, not you. You are the branch that bears the fruit of the vine. And that's in the next chapter of John 15. It flows from this. In verse 12, quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall also do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father, unquote. Again, bearing fruits is not producing fruit of yourself. That is for wage workers and hirelings and the wolves. What works did Jesus do? The miracles and healings? 
No, actually, those were for signs to Israel promised by the prophets. It was his ministry. It was speaking the truth and life. It was uprooting the doctrines of the Pharisees. We can't do taking away of sins of the world. Only Jesus can do that work, and it is finished. We can only cast seed and water, and God giveth the increase. What greater works than these is Jesus talking about? Well, who knows, honestly, but how about extending past the borders of Israel, which was Jesus' earthly ministry, not the Gentiles, and we go into the whole world with the invitation to the Gentiles of the gospel of salvation. Verse 15, quote, If you love me, keep my commandments, unquote. Uh-oh, gracers are in trouble, you dirty, greasy gracers. What commandments? Well, Jesus just said a new commandment I give you, love one another. What about the commandments on the Sermon on the Mount? What about the commandment of love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself? That is the whole law encapsulated in that. As if we need the whole Mosaic law, as we keep the royal law, as James calls it? Am I now a legalist? No. But as far as the Sermon on the Mount, you mean the ones where if you look at a woman with lust in your eye, gouge it out because it is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than your whole body to be thrown into hell? Ah! Guess what? Absolutely no one obeys it, and they are hypocrites destined for hell if this perspective is indeed true, which it is not. I gotta do a video on the Sermon on the Mount. Funny. I hear churches doing a series on the Beatitudes because they're so beautiful. My sarcasm isn't against the Beatitudes, it's against the churches. But they steer clear of the sermon that follows from the Beatitudes. And if they do teach on it, then you know one of two things. They are either hail, brimstone, and hellfire hypocrites, or they excuse away the hard sayings as allegory, pretending as if it's some kind of mystical Jewish idiom with no reference point. The point of the Sermon on the Mount was to expose that all, everyone, covets, lust, and desires the flesh. You cannot keep the law, nor can you be justified by the law. That is the point of the Sermon on the Mount. Of the Ten Commandments, there was one that had no physical action, but exposes the wretchedness of man's heart. Thou shalt not covet. That's what Jesus was doing. That's what he exposed on the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon wasn't supposed to be a feel-good message. Even the TV show The Chosen seriously screwed this episode up. And honestly, I love the show. I still love to watch it. Everyone walking away saying, Oh, what a great teaching. No, it was a teaching of condemnation under the law. It was to show that they are condemned by the law and to point them to a better way, free from the law, Jesus Christ. So, yeah, no, rightly divide, folks. The commandments and flow are to believe on the one in whom he has sent, Jesus Christ. To love one another as Christ has loved us. God is grace. If you fell for the fiery dart from Satan when he says, keep my commandments, then keep watching. The commandment which Jesus is speaking is the same as the reality of Christ in you. John 10, that chapter I quoted before, is the introduction to the commandment. Quote, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This commandment I have received of my Father, unquote. Is this the commandment we are to keep? Yeah, it is. How? It is not a commandment we act out in some works fashion of doing or not doing. When we hear, keep my commandment, we think of commandments as a work that we do. Then why does scripture say over and over and over again that we are saved not of works? Say hello to the new perspective. Keep my commandment is the same as keep his commandment. Quote, this commandment I have received of my father, unquote. 
To keep his commandment is first to recognize it is the commandment he received to do, not you. Second, this commandment is the gospel of Jesus laying down his life and taking it up again. How do you keep this commandment? Do you agree with Jesus' commandment he received? That he was to lay down his life and take it up again? Yes, you do. Then you have kept his commandment by accepting the gospel of salvation and grace through faith in him, following his commandment when you keep his commandment. The epistle of 1 John chapter 2 indeed clarifies this. Verse 7, quote, Brethren, I write no commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Unquote. Oh, well, that's kind of a conundrum of a statement. Okay, old commandment. Is Satan firing darts? Is this the law of Moses? The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. John opened this epistle with these words describing Jesus Christ. I'm breaking that down very slowly, not to be mean, but because it's important. 1 John 1, verses 1 and 3. That which was from the beginning. You notice how the language is exactly the same? Which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have held the word of life, unquote. The word of life is Christ. The apostles held Jesus in their hands. The apostles looked upon Christ with their own eyes. That which was from the beginning is the old command, is Jesus Christ. Quote, verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ." Unquote. There it is. Both the mystery, the mansion, the abode, Christ in the Father and the Father in Christ, and it is the old command. The old command is Jesus Christ. Point blank in your face from the epistle of John, who revealed the mystery of the body of Christ in the Gospel of John. Go figure, it's John who's defining it for us. From the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry and their discipleship to him, that is the old command. For they saw him with their own eyes and touched the Son of God in the flesh while he was with them. The new command is the mystery. 1 John 2.8, quote, Again, a new command I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Do you remember that first verse that we studied, the abode, and the, those who abode in Christ should not be in darkness? Here it is again, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth because he was glorified. The new command is not something to do or not do as we think of commands in fleshly terms of works being unto repentance BS. The verse clearly says the new command which is the truth in him and in you. That is all in all of what is said about the new command. No conditional statement of if-then of works, because it ain't a work commandment, and because salvation is not by works. It is a commandment of truth, of God in God, of Father in the Son and Son in the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. No commandment of do X, Y, Z. And the Spirit in you, and Christ in you, and you in Christ, and because you in Christ, and then you in the Father, and the body Christ, it's all a reality to embrace and not pollute with self-righteousness and self-justification that blocks the reality. It is to believe that Jesus laid down his life and took it back up. A commandment of belief, 
a commandment of belief in the gospel. We keep his commandment. This is not a commandment of ordinance, not a commandment to prevent negative outcome like the law. Thou shalt not? No. The verse says, if you love me, keep my commandments. As in, if you love me, keep his commandments. It is Jesus who was commanded to lay down his life, and this is what we are to keep by the gospel of salvation. It is a different way of keeping his commandment than to be obedient to the law. Let's do a progress check. If you see it, then you have freedom. If you don't, indeed you have confusion. The original verse to keep his commandment is also an allusion to the reality of the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father. It is the pretext of what launches the moment Satan took the bait entering Judas, setting off a chain reaction that would cascade into salvation for all men, especially those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.10 The next section of scripture is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, quote, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know it, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I think most of Christendom understands that the Holy Spirit resides in the believer. So we have the Son and the Father, and the Father and the Son. Now we have the Spirit in us. Verse 18, quote, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Jesus speaking what he spoke in the beginning of the chapter in verses 2-4. through four. This is his coming. Not the rapture, not the second coming advent in the day of Armageddon. He is the Spirit. Now the promise in verse 20, quote, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What a Godhead conundrum. And yet we are invited in. So the Son is in the Father, and the Father is in the Son, and the Spirit is in us, and Jesus comes to us, and we are in Jesus, and Jesus in us. Woo! The Spirit first came at Pentecost in Acts 2. The Jewish fold in the upper room, plus another 3,000 and another 5,000 after that in the book of Acts. Later, the Spirit came without baptism to the Gentiles in Acts 10 through Peter and Cornelius. Important distinction between the two folds of John 10, where Jesus proclaims the mystery first to the Jewish fold. Verse 21, quote, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him." Unquote. So the commandment is to believe on the one in whom he sent, and to love one another as I have loved you, and to believe that Christ indeed laid down his life and took it back up again, so the gospel of salvation is the commandment. Great. Now keepeth them? Like continually? Actually, yes. Salvation is sealed and permanent. Believe and you are saved is the word of truth. Here, we need to keep it. Works? No. Don't be duped by another fiery dart from Satan. And I'm not going to backload works onto the gospel. Keeping is the renewal. The washing of the water of the word. The sanctification in Christ. There are the second soil and third soil believers that are saved, and they will enter the kingdom as by fire of the beam of judgment if they are truly dead believers. They have nothing to offer. They didn't love God. They said thank you for salvation at some point in their lives and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Then the lusts of life, the riches of the world, the deceitfulness choked the plant or it had no root or no depth and it withered and died. These folks don't and can't really keepeth the command. They don't mature from milk to the meat. I'm sorry, but they don't love God. They love the carnality of the flesh and the worries of the world and the lusts of the flesh. They are why all those scary verses by Paul exist because many of the Gentile disciples didn't keepeth the commandment. Yet the God of grace is faithful when we are unfaithful. So no, these carnal Christians, Jesus isn't manifested to them. 
If you are freaking out because you know you are still carnal, chill out. I'm glad you are rebuked, and you should be glad too. A parable teaches a spiritual truth, but it is not absolute. You may be a second soil believer, or a third soil believer, with fruit not to perfection. I urge you to remember that tribulation bringeth forth patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Today is only a snapshot of your walk in the Spirit. So good, feel admonished, and keep your eyes on Christ alone, and let Him continue to work in you until His coming, that soon you will be transplanted into the good soil and bring forth fruit unto perfection in Him as He is in you. Again, salvation is permanent and you are sealed, and I am not preaching works to manifest Christ in you. We can grieve and quench the Spirit. Not the way most think by saying swear words or not living the ideal Christian lifestyle, but most do it by the spirit of Jezebel and seducing doctrines of demons and proclaiming false gospels and perverting the gospel of salvation. Being saved and having Christ manifested in yourself are not the same, but both are achieved the same by believing on Christ alone. The alone part is where man screws up. First, they screw it up on the gospel side. And if they have accepted the true gospel, then they screw it up by trying to justify themselves after being saved, even when they've known the true gospel. Abraham is the example. Abraham messed this up with Hagar. Already being justified by his belief, Abraham, rather than having patience, an important thing to understand, which I'm still learning, patience for the promised seed, he justified himself having child with Hagar, and the seed of the illegitimate haunts Israel to this day. John 14, 23, quote, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him." Unquote. And there it is, your mansions and your rapture. No, the rapture is elsewhere. Manifesting Christ in your life is the promise and spoken of even in Christendom, albeit by substitute methods, strategies, and frankly witchcraft and the vain false promises of how to achieve it by your own action and often sacrifices, it's not achieved by your own works. It's not achieved by your own self-pity and loathing. It's not achieved by your own self-righteousness. The commandments are the same as the promise of Christ manifesting himself in you. I want that. I need that. How? Romans 12, 2, quote, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God." Unquote. That will is for all men to believe on Jesus Christ. In Titus 3 verse 5, quote, "...not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost." Unquote. Again, not by works, He saved us. The washing of regeneration was exercised in the Gospel account of John as well. Did you notice where? When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. I didn't point it out earlier in John 13. The act was of service towards others in the flesh. Sure, great, a good thing to do. And that's where Christendom stops the lesson. But the teaching is deeper as it always is. It is a typological picture and proof that Jesus is our sanctification. The washing of regeneration was pictured by Jesus telling Peter, You are already clean. Just your feet are dirty. Now get to work to clean yourself or you're going to hell. No. Peter was already clean 
by his belief in Christ. But we are still in corruptible flesh. And we have Jesus wash our feet to tidy us up. This is the picture of sanctification. The initial washing that made Peter clean was justification. Once and done. Hence Jesus telling Peter he is already clean. I find verse 7 amazing. Quote, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shall know hereafter. Unquote. So what do I do to you now you don't understand, but later you will understand. I was never taught this by man, that the washing of the feet is the picture of sanctification in Christ. The Holy Spirit taught me this. Did anyone who watched this already know this? Comment below. Is this a teaching that was lost to the winds of time? Jesus said they'd understand it hereafter. Now we wash each other's feet by keeping his commandments, that Jesus laid down his life and had the power to take it back up again. This is the commandment he had been given. The gospel of salvation. We remind each other of this reality and in so doing, wash our brother's feet. Of course, it is still deeper. In Ephesians 5, 26, quote, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, unquote. The it is speaking about the body of Christ, the church. Layer upon layer, precept upon precept. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. The washing of water by the word is keeping the commandment that Jesus laid down his life and took it back up again. Jesus is the word. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. John is loaded. It is John 4 where Jesus speaks of the living water that springs up to eternal life. He is the water that quenches our thirst and subdues our cravings, lusts, and desires. He is the tree of life in New Jerusalem, which rivers of living water proceed out of. He is the one who washes us in sanctification. Hebrews 10.10, 10, quote, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all, unquote. So do not listen to any heretic that preaches sanctification is a works-based process of doing or not doing actions and works. Self-sanctification, aka progressive sanctification, is justification of the self before God and an idol in the place of Jesus' work and the Father's will. It is the action that voids Christ's manifestation in you. It perverts the gospel, which is how we keep his commandment to let Christ dwell in us. The heretic says this is the evidence of one's faith. The evidence of your faith is if you believe the gospel. If your testimony is full of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, I know you are a brother or sister. If your testimony is full of yourself and your life and your fruits, I know you are Cain. The heretic claims the believer's life will be transformed, markedly different. Okay, ask how that works. A mature Christian who has Christ manifested in them will have a markedly different life. It will be the testimony to find out if it is the blood of Christ or the labors of the field to bring forth a sacrifice of fruits, Abel or Cain. The heretic will speak of grace out of one side of his mouth, then say, but, and give you conditions of law-keeping. The double-minded man from the video, the book of James, the mystery finally solved. The new commandment teaching from the gospel according to John is the new creation of the body of Christ, hid from the foundation of the world. It is the access to heavenly places now. It is the freedom you so desire from the coveting, lust, and desires that you still have, even if you have conquered some of your sins in the power and strength of your own flesh. I'd pray that you are too weak so that that manifestation of Christ comes more quickly and your patience be more shortly endured. It ought to be the yearning of our souls to have Christ manifested in ourselves in order to drink the living water to finally quench the 
thirst for righteousness and extinguish things you ought not to want according to your conscience or the law. The only way to defeat the law of sin in your members, which is stronger than your desire for righteousness, is to allow the only thing stronger than the law of sin to crush it for you, Jesus Christ. I like Luke's account, quote, But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all of his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils, unquote. Good point for a blurb about the armor of God from Ephesians 6. By this point in the video, you should know what I'm going to say. If it doesn't point to Jesus Christ, then it is nothing. The helmet of salvation, Jesus Christ. The sandals of the gospel of peace, Jesus Christ. The breastplate of righteousness, well this is obviously a good and upright heart that stirs up our spirit and causes us to do the works of God when he speaks to your heart. No, it is Jesus Christ, not the New Age crap that are rivers of sewage that flow through the institutional churches today. Unless your armor is the armor of Jesus Christ himself, then the strong man, the law, is going to disarm your armor and divide your spoils. Picture the law of sin, we're talking Romans 7 here, as the one who is stronger than the armored man. That is us pretty much in our flesh. The law of sin will win. Facts. Jesus concludes, quote, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Unquote. Does this passage now have new meaning that used to be more mysterious? Yes. The gathering together in 1 Corinthians 15 is still the rapture. I'm not going to ruin that rapture verse like I did with the mansions one. But the gathering with him is the reality of the new commandment keeping. Only Christ can take the desires and lusts away. But if you're filling yourself with anything else other than Christ, fighting your flesh with your flesh, then Christ ain't invited, now is he? Or you think you can invite both Jesus and your own strength? If any man has two masters, he will hate the one. How about, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. That's how deep this struggle of faith versus works is. So let me do another rebuke. To the ones trying to bring us greasy gracers and the legalists together? You blind hippies calling for peace when the reality is it is God versus the devils, believers versus the Pharisees, and you have chosen to pretend to be the peacemakers between us? Good luck! Reality is you're just going along to get along and play the middle field. You're a coward and still stand against grace when you say, you're saved by grace, but you're also saved by works. Or you say, you're saved by grace, but you speak grace and look like us, but your doctrine works iniquity. Back on point. We have the seal of the Holy Spirit. That is the guaranteed promise. But the manifestation of Christ has a condition. If we act like Abraham and seek to justify ourselves, even after being declared righteous, then we will experience a dry spell. Being the example, God didn't speak to Abraham for 13 years after Hagar. Again, if your name is in the Bible and you are made an example of by the judge, then it is more severe than the average offender. Be glad you aren't made example of for all of human history, you little guy or gal. The trick is to get back to God right now, the exact same way you were saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Quote, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. Seeing the new commandment in John is incredibly important because it reveals the mystery of the power of God in the life of the believer. 
Without it, the believer is doomed to their flesh. I am not preaching hell. I am preaching walking in the spirit, but I am not accusing them of walking after the flesh. It is how to walk in the light, but not admonishing them that they are walking in darkness. If a brother or sister's eyes are open to what I have taught today, they are still saved as long as they believe that faith is the power of salvation, free from works in Christ alone. And I preach that it is Christ alone in the light and in the walk of the Spirit. The sanctification is still Christ, not only the justification. This was Jesus' first lesson of the mystery in the book of John, your so-called mansions. The next lesson that ties into this theme is the mysteries. This was one of those mysteries. So you say, yes, I want Christ manifested in my life. I believe the gospel, and that is also how I manifest Christ. And I'm going to go to my prayer closet and going to allow Christ to manifest himself in me. Let's go. I love the fervor. I do. The gospel verse we just read adds something important. Ephesians 2.10, quote, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, unquote. You say now, yeah, I know we are his workmanship, so? It takes time. Philippians 1.6, quote, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, unquote. We cannot go into the prayer closet, or in this case, the prayer kitchen, and treat God as a recipe to whip up Christ in you with two parts gospel and please as a teaspoon of sugar. We have things we use unaware or aware as self-justifiers that need to be pruned off. In a moment, I will give my testimony on making this teaching and what I went through that exposed my own self-justification standing in the way these last few days. So let's insert the lesson of patience. I told you to remember that word, patience. Quote, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what do you know? The gospel. By whom we also have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience, unquote. Romans 5, 1 through 3. We do not, hopefully, need the schoolmaster of the law to teach us if we are under grace. But God still has a schooling program for us. Tribulation leads to patience. From my recent James video, James tells us to find joy in diverse temptations because they lead to patience. From patience, we will learn experience, likened to wisdom. Experience is lived wisdom. In essence, I went through that. I know that type of stuff. Finally, experience leads to hope. So yes, you do have the recipe. So maybe think of baking the Christ in you cake is an instant gratification, but don't think that you have a kitchen timer that can be set for the time it takes a believer to step out of the way to let God do his manifesting in us. I do pray for you that it happens today, but be patient. I also said that we would discuss the everlasting covenant, but I don't want to spend the time because this one is already very long. So in summary, the everlasting covenant is what we are under, made by the blood of Christ. Most don't even know that this exists. They think there's the old covenant and the new covenant. No, there is an everlasting covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is what the body of Christ has access through. We'll cover that more in a future teaching, hopefully in the mysteries. So now, in writing this script and researching the word, I have a testimony. For this teaching, I experienced a level of condemnation that I haven't experienced in several years since finally hearing the unadulterated, unperverted gospel and believed it. 
Not only was I spiritually in a whirlwind where I couldn't get my bearings back on Christ, even though as writing down these very words I've been preaching to you, the truth on Christ wanting to dwell in us, I was physically exhausted and spiritually inept. I was encapsulated in sin. I couldn't muster up any strength to leave my house. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I did sleep at night, but woke every half hour to twist and turn in bed only to wake up with back pain from contorting my body to try to sleep. I popped three rounds of four ibuprofen for the headache that just wouldn't leave me alone. I wasn't physically sick, and the condemnation came from temptations of lust, not just women, but possessions. I want a fat bike for the winter. That's a totally unrelated thing. And I was condemned for speaking and teaching on what you haven't experienced, this Christ in you stuff. You don't know what you're talking about. Go for a bike ride. All you care about is blowing a few grand on yourself so you don't have to be depressed like you always are in the winter. You aren't holy. You will never experience his holiness. Don't think I don't know. You weren't checking out those girls at the gym. What would your wife say? You think Jesus loves you? You're wrong on the commandments. Do you see how focused you are on your sins right now? Guess what, buddy? You're back under the law. I'm your schoolmaster. You're a hypocrite. You'll be judged more severely for teaching lies. You sure about that? You can't find Christ because you're still justifying yourself. You don't know him and he doesn't know you. What is this? I wondered. I've been chastened and I was happy to receive a rebuke and be pointed out my error before so I could correct it. This is not that. I prayed for relief. I prayed for Christ's manifestation. But it was like I was on a drug that was a spiritual inhibitor. I felt alone. I needed to disconnect entirely. Reading the word was not washing me. Praying was not stilling the waves. I opened up one streaming app. No appetite for anything on there, just a bunch of junk. So I opened another. I found a dumb movie to watch, not something I've done in some time. Surely enough, as I'm watching it, there is a logo with a slogan on it in the movie that says, The New Reality. I think that's weird. I'm writing about the new reality of the body of Christ being introduced in John's account. Then the characters move into a giant mansion. I'm like, okay, seriously? The same style of confirmation I received on the Bose study. I just got it here. Not in the movie. And God doesn't say anything in my ear. Hey, servant, I have a word for you. No, he speaks to me through divine appointments with people, mainly. Or seeing something as I walk down the street that relates to something I'm praying about. Or in this case, I clicked on a movie that has nothing to do with anything and I'm trying to just be distracted. And then the exact same phrases are said. Or the subject I'm speaking about has been shown in the movie. Anyway, I told my wife after she got home. I told her of the condemnation and all the stuff going on. I gave her the little piece about the washing of the disciples' feet being the picture of sanctification, and she told me, keep going. She then looked up Old Testament references and gave me Exodus. Two days, wash your robes to sanctify yourself, speaking about Mount Sinai. The new reality is Christ is the one who sanctifies us. The old way didn't work, now did it? Where you sanctified yourself. So indeed, the Old Testament confirms that washing is sanctification in Exodus. The next day arrived, which is today, and the lack of energy was still here. I felt like I was a Jacob wrestling with God. In my, let's call it wrestling instead of yelling match. I decided to finish watching the movie I had started. While I had no strength and my back hurt, like Jacob's hip was busted. I pressed play and the words came up. You're never going to change, will you? Open the door. In that moment, in my reflection on the prayer I just had with God about my self-doubt and self-pity being a form of self-justification, my lack of strength physically and spiritually, yet I myself believing the gospel. What is this? What are you? Woe is me. The answer, you'll never really change, will you? Open the door. I can't change who I am. He is who he is, the I am that I am. He is God, and I am what I am a sinner. I will never really change, now will I? That is the point. Now, open the door. The last few days of condemnation and distraction, the twisting of verses in my mind, has been a micro 40 days in the wilderness for me, where the devil twisted the word to convince me that I am unworthy. 
I wrote a lot about the fiery darts in this presentation. That's not the norm for me. So indeed, I myself ended up facing a lot of fiery darts from Satan. The cliche saying of Christ meets you where you are is true. And man, do I hate it when cliche things seem to be right. The same way Christ saves you wherever you are is how he manifests himself to you wherever you are. You will never really change, will you? Remember the law of sin is stronger than man, and there is only one stronger than him, Christ. Anything we do in the meantime to try and change ourselves to be more holy or more just or more righteous is idolatry. Face the facts. You are who you are, and you are not the I am that I am. Stop trying to be. That was my lesson, and I give it to you. Jesus wants to be our godliness. Jesus wants to be our holiness. Jesus wants to be our justification. Jesus wants to be our justice. And Jesus wants to be our righteousness. Now, open the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me.